Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, James Pittman here. Uh, this is the webinar on immigration law for startups. And I have as my guest today, attorney Fiona McEntee. And uh, she is a well-known immigration lawyer uh, who focuses a lot of her practice on startups. So I'm very pleased to have her uh, here with me for what's going to be a very informative and engaging discussion on the topic. Let me now introduce Fiona. Fiona, thanks so much for joining me. Please tell me about your background and uh, as a lawyer, and how did you come to focus on startups specifically as a niche? Thanks so much, James. Thank you for having me and welcome to everyone who's joining us today and for those who are watching later. Um, so if my name didn't give it away, my accent certainly does. Um, I am originally from Ireland. I um, moved to the US when I was about 20 years old, initially for a year as part of an exchange program. And then later, a few, a few years later, came back as an F1 international student. Um, so I've been practicing immigration law exclusively for my career, which has been over 15 years. And um, throughout that time, I have developed a kind of a niche practice within immigration. A lot of our clients are startups um, and we work with founders and, you know, key employees. And as the startup grows, you know, supporting other employees. But um, I'm, we're based in Chicago. Obviously, immigration is federal, as most people likely know. So we do have clients all over the US. But Chicago has a great and Illinois has a very exciting startup scene. And it's a it's a huge like hugely popular destination for international students so a lot of these fantastic international students that are studying here at the universities go on to create startups and that's kind of initially how I got involved in the startup scene was um, mentoring at various incubators and meeting international students and being a former international student myself having just this kind of connection to people who are on that path. Well, that is a very, very interesting, and I'm sure that um, you, you find it to be a gratifying, uh, you know, area of practice. Let's talk about um, some of the uh, aspects of immigration law as it pertains to startup companies. Now, let's talk about first. I guess we should sort of talk about what do we mean when we say a startup company. What would your definition uh, of a startup be, Fiona? I mean, I don't know that there's any one particular definition, but what you kind of when when you think about startups, um, you're you're kind of contrasting that to maybe a um, a business that might have like let's say in the retail sense one or two locations, or they're not they're not necessarily they could be a very successful family business or smaller business, but maybe they're not you know, um, raising capital or th from venture capitalists. They're not maybe aiming to be the next like Meta or Twitter. You know, when we think of startups, we generally think of, of companies that potentially have this high growth and may also be fundraising from outside investors, such as angel investors or venture capital funds. Um, they might be participating in accelerators or based in incubators. So those types of things is what I think about when I think about um, a startup. Now, um, I mean, uh, at once upon a time, Docket was Docket was itself was a startup, but uh, and tech startups are certainly the first first thing that comes to mind. But aside from you know technology, software, IT, uh, what other industries do you see startups uh, emerging in that consult you for legal advice? Um, I mean, we do a lot of software, a lot of mm -hmm. software, okay, um, so it is. software as a service. Yeah, SaaS companies, um, but also medical, med tech, um, you know, some some biotech. Um, mm -hmm. So it and it, it's really kind of non-industry specific. Um, so yeah. we have clients from pretty much all across the board, but I do think we see a lot of um, tech and a lot of like soft that software, even as a subset of tech, um, is the types of clients that we would see a lot of. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Well, um, one of the main topics that we want to talk about is the international entrepreneur rule, and this was a uh, regulation uh, that came out during the Obama era. Uh, uh, actually, uh, my correct or is that during the it was during the Trump era, uh, 2017? Fiona, is that right? Yeah, so it was written during the Obama administration okay. gotcha. with a view to going into effect, you know, mm -hmm. it, like six months into Trump administrations. Gotcha. 
10 years. So it would have okay. taken effect in the June, in the summer of, of that year. Right. And it came out amid a lot of fanfare that it was going to really facilitate uh, the uh, uh, entry into the United States of entrepreneurs who are well poised uh, to establish startups and, and, and be extremely uh, something that would inject a lot of vitality into our business climate. And we, as uh, you know, the United States, as uh, still the premier global economic uh, superpower, really uh, always wants to continue to rejuvenate itself by bringing in capable people who want to establish business enterprises. So Fiona, you're, I know you're very involved in uh, utilizing the entrepreneur role and advocating uh, around the entrepreneur role, I'd love for you to explain to us uh, as an expert in this area, you know, what, what the rule is, who's eligible for it, how has implementation been so far, and what, what issues are there in utilizing it for clients? Yeah, so I think that was a great kind of description of why we need it, but I think we need to actually take a little step back and say, you know, why was there a regulation created to begin with? Like why, um, you know, how come we ended up down the path of like a regulation being created and, and using what essentially is the Department of Homeland Security's parole authority? Um, and the reason that, that that ended up happening is because the U.S. does not have a startup visa. Um, and that's so important because we stand in contrast to many of our international peers that do have startup visas. Um, I have just written an, an op-ed piece with immigration, an immigration lawyer from the UK and immigration lawyers from Canada, and essentially like contrasting the system here versus the systems in both of those places to kind of illustrate how you know, the US, we're still really dealing with a 30 plus year old immigration law. And that's kind of the, the biggest issue here is the fact that Congress hasn't really passed any new immigration laws in many, many years. And so because of that, you know, the administration, the Obama administration was looking at ways that we could, you know, try to attract international startups using the existing law. And so I kind of like compare this in a way to the like using DACA, the deferred action for dreamers, right? Because Congress didn't pass the Dream Act. And so, you know, you, you find that where an administration wants to be welcoming to, to immigrants and wants to be, you know, taking a modern look at the system, when Congress isn't passing these laws, they're looking and saying, like, what can we do with the existing authority that we have? And how can we apply that to maybe situations that weren't contemplated back in the day? So that, that's kind of the biggest issue. And, um, you know, it's so unfortunate because, if you look at the data and it's not, you know, you don't have to take my word for it, you know, over 55% of unicorns in America. So that's companies that have a billion dollar valuation over 55% of them have an immigrant founder or co-founder. And so like hearing that you would think, oh, our system must make it so easy for all these, you know, unicorn founders to come here. But the reality is that actually, when you look at the data about how a lot of them came to the US, they came through other routes, not like their own startup, you know, sponsoring themselves, right? They, they likely came through a family-based immigration system or perhaps a refugee system or through initially as an as a employee and maybe later created their startup. So, and so that's kind of a huge problem. This is why we were so excited when we got the International Entrepreneur Parole Program, because we felt like, fantastic, this is the you know utilizing the existing law to apply it to startups and try to see you know um how we can attract them so this is the rule that was that was put forth in the obama administration it was then you know supposed to be implemented during six months into the trump administration and was was stopped right it, they basically announced that they were going to be rescinding it they said that they weren't going to be um you know following through on this um i recall a press release where they mentioned um that that we had the eb5 and the e2 so why did we even need this and and to me it just showed a complete you know lack of understanding about what the startup is you know startups are not you're not putting in your own eb5 money or e2s you know it just was a totally it was like apples to oranges so anyway there was a lot of litigation and one of the main litigators in this was the or main the plaintiffs was the National Venture Capital Association um, who sued. So anyway, long story short, 
the Biden administration said, we're bringing this, we're officially implementing this. And we were so excited. We're like, this is back. You know, it's actually not even back because it was never really here. Um, and and so unfortunately, though, it hasn't really, um, I don't know a lot of people who've utilized it successfully. And we'll get into that. But that's a bit of background that I hope is helpful to frame out why, you know, it, it, on paper, it looks like it's been around for quite a while. But in reality, it, it really has not been. Mm -hmm. OK, that's a very good background. And, and who is eligible uh, for it according to its own terms? So immigrant entrepreneurs are eligible for this if they have, um, there's a few requirements, a major ownership share in a company that's been created in the past five years or created within five years of receiving, um, you know, financing investment. So 10%, like a major ownership, 10% share in a company, you know, relatively recent company. And um, they also must have an active and central role in the company. So not kind of being like a silent founder where you're not actually participating in it. Um, and then the overarching thing is that you need to show that your company will have a positive public benefit on the US. And so this is kind of going back to this, uh, you know, authority to parole people into the US who have a public, who will bring, you know, a benefit to the US. So this is kind of where the crux of the cases come in, because you need to show, you can show public benefit in a few ways. Um, if you've received significant investment, um, about six or 264K, it was originally 250 and was adjusted up to about 264,000. If you've received that level of, fun of funding from qualified investors, which we can get into later. So thinking venture capitalists, angel investors, startup accelerators. If you've re received 264,000 the startup has from these types of people, then you would appear to be eligible for the parole. Um, Another way is that if you've received significant awards or grants um, from certain federal, state or government entities, around 105,000 in, in terms of grants. Um, second way. Um, third, it, you know, the way it's written, it doesn't categorically say this is a minimum threshold and you have to meet this, otherwise you're not eligible. It's, it seems to suggest that if you have, have raised some capital, but maybe you're not quite at that level, you may still be able to um, demonstrate that you qualify if you're able to show that the company has rapid um, potential for rapid growth and job creation is kind of the overarching things that you need to focus on. And there's, you know, a few ways that we can get into how you would show that. Mm -hmm. OK, uh, well, let's. Um, so as, thus far, I mean, are you said you don't know of too many people who have utilized it, who have utilized it successfully. I mean, what is going on? Uh, that's that's, I guess, my, the question that pops into my mind. I it seems like it was released or introduced with much fanfare. But what has happened since? So the biggest issue I would say is the is the processing times, the lack of transparency in relation to processing times for these cases. Um, when the Biden administration announced it, um, they, you know, there was a stakeholder call and we all jumped on it. And I asked a question like, how long are these cases going to take? What's the processing times? There's no processing times listed. You can't premium process them. So they said, oh, we don't have enough data, so we can't you know until we get cases filed we we just don't know how to tell you um what the processing times may be so some of my colleagues i did not do this some of the colleagues were had clients that you know were willing to go for this option and they filed them and then they were just waiting for you know upwards of a year to hear anything back um and in the meantime other people were switching gears they were filing other cases they were trying to explore other options so that's when the when the rule initially came in um, so I think we a lot of us just felt a bit um, disillusioned, I would say, with it. And, and, and therefore, we're kind of looking, I mean, from in our practice, we are only willing to recommend this as an option for people if they are fully understanding of the timeframes and that are, you know, that they don't necessarily need to be in the US in the immediate future and are meeting, you know, are, are happy enough to kind of see what happens with this. Otherwise, you're exploring other options. Um, now, one thing I will add is that in fall, just a few months ago, I went to uh, participated in some advocacy meetings in Washington, D.C. with members of the White House and with the Department of Homeland Security, with the USCIS. In really, and, you know, I kept bringing you know, this up. There was some a lot of discussion that everybody wants this to work, right? The White House, the USCIS, we all want this to work. And so um, 
they understand the frustrations that we're having in relation to processing times and how it, it, it's very difficult for us to recommend this as an option given just you know the on this the huge amount of un you know unknown contrasted with let's say some of the other business immigration options where you know you can premium process so anyway I believe that they listened and heard what we have to say and so I'm hoping that maybe things might start to move a bit faster in the future so I'm a bit more um more inclined to recommend this as an option um going forward to people well, let me just ask you from a nuts and bolts perspective, what, what are we filing? Where are we filing it? And is there an application fee? I mean, what is the form? What are the supporting documents that you would recommend? And where are we filing it? Yeah, so you're filing it at the form. It's, oh, sorry, I thought there was someone asking a question there. There was, um, it's the form I-941. And if you go to the USCIS website, actually, another thing I wanted to say is that, um. USCIS basically said that they 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 had received other feedback from stakeholders and that they had they had published a list of frequently asked questions, which they said they were it's easier to do that than to like create a policy manual. So if you go on the USCIS website and um, the International Entrepreneur Pro section, um, you will find that there is a very, very helpful list of FAQs. There's eligibility requirements, how to apply. And then there's also um, a list of like extremely helpful questions, um, including, you know, um, definitions of qualified investors and, and, and like, you know, can limited partners into like a venture capital fund be based outside of the US, you know, all these types of things. So I would recommend that people go there for make that your main port of call in relation to this. And um, so you're filing the I-941 and there is a fee. The fee is $1,200. There's a biometrics fee um, and then potentially, you know, a, an advanced parole. So the thing to know about this is um, it's a two step process, right? Because it's not a visa you're not changing status to it. You need to file the case, get it adjudicated through the USCIS, and then you need to make an entry. Whether you're outside the US, you get a boarding, some type of boarding foil that, again, some of these are unknown because I don't know people who've gotten to that stage, but you're getting something like a travel document from, from a consulate. Or if you're here and you're able to get an advanced pro, you're leaving and, 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 and being able to re-enter in that, in that way. But I think that's an important point that it's not an actual visa. So you're not changing status to this. You need to get the case adjudicated first and then you need to leave and, and then be paroled into the U.S. Well, that's uh, that's uh, so I mean, is it uh, something which, you know, upon so I see it's supposed to be filed here at the Texas Service Center and then upon approval, have they specified whether it's to go to the, you know, Kentucky uh, Consular Center or a Consular Processing Center or or, or wherever to uh, pick a consulate to notify or what what happens after you you get this approval? How does how does the community how does the approval get to the consulate if you're abroad? So the know? people that I have heard who've gotten, I've only heard of one, maybe two approvals. Um, okay. The one that I had heard had done the advanced parole in the US and left and re-entered and, and, and used that. Um, Canadians also are exempt from having this boarding foil document and, and are, per the regs, permitted to just enter with the approved petition um, or the approved 941. So I'm not sure of the logistics of like consulate, but I would imagine that, you know, the, the, they do discuss you getting a boarding foil in your passport. So I would assume that, you know, there is a consulate appointment involved there. But I think that's the thing, that there are all these kind of later stage, you know, logistical issues that were still kind of TBD because um, the people that I had known that had filed these cases had kind of abandoned them. Um, because they they just were waiting for so long. But, but again, I'm hoping that will change and I will be delighted to share some updates with you, James, when we get clients to okay. that stage. But um, so, you know, I do want to cautiously encourage people to consider this option. Um, I think as long as you're setting the expectations with, with the clients in terms of timelines and if everybody understands, you know, the potential for, you know, just prolonged processing times um like we have a client who's okay with that and we're going to be we're going to be proceeding um and so so I, I you know in that scenario I would feel comfortable recommending this um but it's really about setting expectations I think with the clients uh, how long have these some of these cases been pending did they start taking 
applications in 2017. I mean, we are now in 2023. So is it is it correct that there have been cases actually pending for years at this point? Well, so I know I only heard of one approval during the Trump administration um, and during that whole time period, because it, it, the minute the rule got published, they basically said we're, we're rescinding this. And so um, that's when the lawsuit happened um, with the National Venture Capital Association. And then the, then the Trump administration said, you know, I think it was basically um, NVCA one and, and, and they were told you did, you're you not following the APA to rescind a rule. You're not following the proper procedure. And then they said, OK, well, we are going to actually rescind it. We're going to follow through on the proper um, rules. So I had a client who came to me who had filed one of these in the Trump administration by themselves and um, didn't hear anything back at all. Um, apparently a request for evidence was issued that they never got and ultimately their case got denied but they never had heard any correspondence and they were obviously very upset about this and they had appeared to meet the requirements um, we switched gears and opted for another option for them but no I don't think it's a case that cases have been pending like since since like 2017 I think what happened was there were a few initially filed and they and then with all the announcements of getting of you know rescinding it because the Trump administration had said that before the rule was even going into effect. Mm. So people knew ahead of time, OK, they're getting rid of this. So um, but what, what we did see was when the Biden administration announced that this was coming back, which was in May of what was it 2022? Anyway, in May of and we can look up the date. It must have been um 21, perhaps. But um, those those kind of. Biden administration cases some of them were pending for up to a year um uh, as far as I knew now again that data was was from quite some time ago and I, we've been trying to get an idea of processing times and it's been extremely difficult mm -hmm. well let's talk about the advocacy piece so uh what is going on advocacy wise to try to enable people to utilize this? You mentioned the meeting that you were at. Is there, are there ways that people can get involved? What would you recommend? Yeah, I mean, I think that the advocacy um, kind of can take many forms. I am a firm believer in thinking of like creative ways to use our voices to advocate for changes to policy um, and not just for like one particular case, but to see what can we do to try to change the system. Um, so our meeting in, you know, series of meetings in D.C. was to talk about this, but also to talk about the need for a startup visa. Um, so, you know, that has been over the years, there's been various bills introduced into Congress that have had, you know, certain bipartisan support and um, unfortunately never got to, you know, the finish line. But um, there have been, you know, there's been bipartisan support. I think there is somewhat of a feeling of, you know, everything immigration is polarizing and divisive and everything relates to the southern border and and you know how are we going to get beyond that and and realize that there's other pieces of immigration that are you know business immigration i think that's kind of why our system really stands in contrast to the likes of the uk or canada that are able to you know governments come in and they know that they can just add a piece of immigration like you know legislation that relates to startups and it doesn't have to be like all anyway so I think um, AILA's National Day of Action is coming up, I believe, towards the end of April. So that is something that if anyone's an AILA member, the American Immigration Lawyers Association, I would encourage people to um, see how they can participate in that. Um, another thing that I do that I love to do because I love to write is writing op-eds or letters to the editor. Um, AILA has a great media team that can help and, and help you pitch things out if that's something that you like doing. Um, there's also the AILA blog, Think Immigration. People are there always looking for pieces for that. So if you had a compelling client story that you felt like you wanted to share with or without specifics, that could be something. Um, I also firmly believe in using media to do advocacy as well, whether it's like media interviews or using social media, Twitter, you know, those types of things. So I think that there's lots of different ways to to do advocacy um, in this for this particular issue, a group of us stakeholders, so ALA members and other people that were involved with like startups and international students the National Venture Capital Association um the foundation for science like lots of different groups got together and we formed a coalition and um, to try to um kind of advocate for 
changes that we thought would would help make international entrepreneur parole feasible. And so we ended up submitting an open letter to Secretary Mayorkas um, recommending some changes that we thought would actually enable us to utilize the program. And one of the main changes was in relation to processing times. Um, but that open letter is available for people to see. And um, we got some great signatories on that. And so a kind of a way to creatively like think about other people who are, you know, um, invested in this as, as a, you know, a problem and, and solutions as well. Not just the problem, like here are the solutions that we think may actually work from people who do this work on a day to day basis. So what, what, what was the name of that uh, group that you formed that coalition? And is it still meeting? Um, no, we actually met on we we were meeting once a month um, in relation to it. It's called the Coalition for International Entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. Um, and I can share the letter if anybody's interested in it. Um, but that was something that we were really passionate about. We used to meet, meet it was at least once a month and we drafted this letter and we made some some key recommendations. Um, and I felt like, you know, just the, in terms of the people who are involved, like I said, the National Venture Capital Association, the President's Alliance on Higher Education, um, the Federation of American Scientists, like so many great members that came together, united to talk about um, why we just need this option to work and, and how with some, you know, reasonably small tweaks, this could be a great option for everybody involved. Yeah, I would think that if a, if a startup visa ever is going to come to pass in the United States, we're going to need to have a, a coalition, which is a sustained effort and pulling key people from, uh, you know, certain industries together to, you know, advocate for why specifically a visa for startup founders is necessary uh, to be, you know, added to the existing visa, visa categories. And I would think that that's going to have to be something which is going to have to be a really strong and sustained effort. Um, so, you know, perhaps um, this a group that, you, you know, you have been involved in, hopefully that can stay in the fight and maybe, uh, you know, people can build build it and build around it. But if you want to share that letter, then um, I'd be I'd be uh, more than happy to share that with uh, the recording of today's session and the other materials we're going to put with uh, today's webinar. So we would love to see it. Yes, I would be delighted to share. And it was, you know, culmination of like many, many, many months of work and just collaboration between different interest groups. And, you know, if, if you know, the most recent version of a startup visa that we have was, was representative Zoe Lofgren's um, LIKE Act. And I love the kind of creative acronyms that are used. So it was the Let Immigrants Kickstart the Economy Act. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, it, it what you what you'll see if you look at the bill, the draft bill, like the, the requirements in that in a startup visa kind of mirrored this international entrepreneur pro program. Um, and um it it created a new W1 visa for founders, a W2 visa, um, and a W3 for um key employees and for, for um family members, and um also had a corresponding green card version of this like startup green card that would not be subject to country specific caps and so um you know i just would encourage people if this is something that you're interested in that you're passionate about you know keep your eyes out for things in the newspaper if you see an opinion and you feel like you want to write a short letter to the editor in response you know that's something that you could do um i think what not a huge amount of work and it makes you feel good like you're 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 not just shouting into a void although you may be but you're actually like you know, using your skills and your voice to advocate for something. And, and if nothing happens, OK, but at least you feel like you're trying. You know, another thing that I felt very fortunate that I was able to do was I submitted written testimony for a congressional hearing in relation to the startup visa. And um, the congressional hearing was um, entitled, Oh, Canada, how the outdated U.S. immigration systems uh, system is pushing top talent to other countries. And again, Representative Lofgren was, you know, kind of spearheading that. Um, and people, you know, were I was interviewed to, for the committee and then ultimately submitted like some written testimony for that to talk about it. Um, yeah. So uh, as you're informing us of this, I mean, and as I'm getting a clear picture of, of where things stand, I'm actually finding myself just, you know, double taking over this that I it's it's so surprising to me. This is so very, very important. And to hear that it is so the the parole program is so stalled and you're telling us that the parole program was utilized in the first place because we don't have a startup visa and how there's not really 
uh, a legislative push ongoing at the moment. There's nothing I immediate. There's nothing sort of impending uh, legislatively to allow for startup uh, visa. This really strikes me as an enormous sort of omission. I mean, that is it's it's so very important. Um, these are the people that uh, we should most be encouraging to come to the country. Uh, uh, yeah. These these people just add such enormous dynamism uh, and uh, add so much potential for, for growth and progress in our economy and our society. If we're going to, uh, I mean, these would be the first people I would think that you would want. So it's, it's yeah. quite surprising to me to hear uh, that it's, it's, that it's, it's not a, a bigger issue that's even more uh, present in our consciousness, and and I'm going to look more closely at uh, at the you know the the links that you provide and 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 uh, see uh, in more detail what's what exactly is going on because now I'm I'm really becoming enormously curious about it now that you're talking about this. Right, I'm so happy to hear that because I am so passionate about this. Like I kind of talk about the start of visa or this as like a third child. I have two children of my own already, and I feel like this is like a third baby of mine and I think you know basically what you said essentially if I'm paraphrasing is like this is a no-brainer right as I always say as they say in America like a very American phrase like this is a no-brainer like this is a win-win-win right you know people are you know not stealing anyone's jobs these startup founders are creating jobs right, right? Um, and like you can look so one of the stats um, from the National Foundation for American Policy, there's a great brief that would, that lists all these like billion dollars, you know, you can find all the stats, but it says, you know, these unicorn startups that um, a, a quarter of them, right, were founded by um, somebody who came as an international student to the US, right? And of those, these unicorns with this international student founder have created 860 jobs on average. And I mean, this, there's no reason why everything needs to be politically partisan, you know, everything immigration needs to be this way. And, um, you know, I, I will be happy to share some of the people when the piece that hopefully that, that I've co-written with the other immigration attorneys gets published to share it just so you can kind of see like, okay, other countries don't really operate this way. Like maybe there is some merit here to what's going on to like being able to modernize such an old system mm -hmm. um to attract these because at the end of the day you know our loss is, is these countries gains right i mean there are people who are not able to figure out the immigration options here not that there aren't any there are options they're just not they just weren't created with the current ecosystem in mind right. but people are like maybe i'll go to canada Oh, yes. Canada has a startup visa that that is so popular that last year I think received three times the amount of applicants than it did the previous year. It's a hugely successful program, and you know it's Canada's not very far from the U.S. and so um, you know something to keep in mind as well. So I implore everybody who's uh, watching now or watching later, um, if if this is something that interests you, please go into the links that we're going to provide and and get involved in the issue and uh, help to build you know, the advocacy efforts, attend the ALA Day of Action, find out more about the issue, reach out to people, get involved because it's, it's enormously important. And uh, what Fiona is saying is exactly right. I mean, if, they're, if, those, if these most talented entrepreneurs are not coming here, they're gonna look elsewhere uh, and we need to remain as competitive as possible. All right. So having having said that, let's talk a little bit about some of the other visa categories that you use. And Fiona, let's talk about some visa categories that you commonly use for startup founders and key employees. And let's talk a little bit first about the analytical framework uh, that you use to determine what the best options are for clients that come to you. So, yeah, when I am doing an initial consult with the client, you know, I, I actually find it very helpful to first set the scene with the client, you know, to explain the outdated immigration system. Like, I don't need to speak for, you know, as I've done for a long time here on it, but just to let them know, look, this is a really old system. You know, sometimes it is square peg round hole type situation so that they understand, because a lot of times people think, oh, America, the American dream, everyone must be, you know, the system must be so welcoming and, you know, and it's not. So you need to set that expectation first. And then I kind of go into explaining how there's potentially an alphabet soup of visa options. But really, though, what you end up doing is you very quickly narrow it down to like two or three or maybe one option, depending on the on the individual. 
um, you know, the the startup founders trajectory um, in terms of like immigration options can really vary depending on a lot of different things and kind of explaining to people that it's a kind of a journey that may have different number of, of you know, stops on the way, depending on your particular case, but um, kind of figuring out where somebody is in terms of physically, are they in the US? Are they here as a student? Are they working on OPT? Do they have the option to do STEM OPT? Like what, how soon do they need their next thing, right? Um, are they abroad? If so, what's their timeline? You know, are they, and, and the questions that you'll likely get is like, can they come in as, as a visitor during the process? Like I get that asked, that question all the time, right? What can I do as a visitor? How often can I enter? You know, those types of things. But, you know, the options that I commonly narrow things down to is the O1A, maybe the O1B if they're creative entrepreneurs, um, the E2 maybe, depending on where they're from, um, a potentially L for international startups that are coming in, um, or um, a lot of times you have somebody who might be on a H1B with another company and has this idea for a startup and being able to talk to them about the limitations of, you know, when you're on a H1B for employer, your current employer, you know, obviously assuming there's no conflict with you giving advice, you don't obviously represent the current employer in this situation, right? Um, what can, how far can you take your startup idea when you're on a H1B for another company? Um, but kind of talking to them about potentially transitioning over to a H-1B, transferring their H-1B if they currently have one. Um, so these are the kind of things that I'm thinking of when I'm trying to advise a startup. Uh, someone asked a question. Uh, actually, we have uh, two questions. Uh, first one is, uh, why is the, I guess the question, I'm going to paraphrase the question, uh, explain the difference between this, the proposed or the entrepreneur parole rule and the, what currently exists as the E2 or uh, E1 visa or the L1 visa. So contrast, and I guess you know, it, implicit in that is sort of why is the E2 not enough? Why? What would a new startup visa add to things that the E2 is not already covering? Okay, the first thing about the E2s is it's only for people who are from a treaty country with the US. India, China, some big countries don't have an E2 treaty. Second thing, the E2 is like great for like, I have my own money that I'm investing in my startup and this is my own personal money. That's a great E2. Um, startups in this sense are raising funding from other people. So it's not their own money. Um, now, sometimes you can you can make that situation work if there is a if there is a parent outside the U.S. that gets funding and then is that parent becomes the investor in the U.S. subsidiary. Um, but a huge important thing to know about E2s is that it is dependent on the company remaining at least 50 percent, ideally 51 plus percent foreign owned startups are raising capital, they're diluting their ownership down, you know, as they go into subsequent funding. At some point in the maybe not so distant future, that startup founder or that startup is will likely not be majority foreign born founder, you know, or foreign owned. So while, um, you know, depending on the trajectory of growth or the fundraising, it, it, that might be sooner rather than later for some, but that's an important issue to be aware of straight away that you want to advise the clients from the get-go that assuming E2 is working for them right now, you know, what's the two-year plan? What When is the fundraising happening? You might need to scramble to try to get everybody off E2s and it's not an ideal situation. Now, if for clients who understand that and, and they go, OK, notwithstanding all that, let's go with the E2 now. Like you can't you need that in the back of your head. You need another plan if and when their ownership gets diluted down below the um 50 percent threshold. So but yeah, lots of reasons why the E2 is kind of scratching a different itch to this like startup visa. And And she also asked about the L1. With the L1, of course, you have to be coming as a transferee. So you're, you you could be coming to open a new office, but you have to already be working for an affiliate of the company. At, uh, you know, you have to be working abroad for an affiliate of the company and you're going to establish the U.S. branch. Fiona, you want to elaborate on the differences here? 
Yeah, exactly. So you need to have been physically present outside the US working for a related entity in order to uh, utilize the L option for startup founders. A lot of times they're in the US already. They're here. They came as an international student. As I mentioned, you know, all the stats about um, the success that international students have. I want to give a shout out to the Illinois Science and Technology Coalition here in Illinois that published a great report. And um, just there a couple of weeks ago, it's um university entrepreneurship index report, but they 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 were able to document that over 40, nearly 45% of university supported startups in Illinois have a foreign born founder. So a lot of these startups founders are already in the US and wouldn't have worked for a related entity prior to coming to the US. So it kind of removes the L as an option. Now, for startups that are abroad that are coming in, like the L could work really well um, for them. But yeah, there's the limitation of the new office L that can only be approved for 12 months. And um, so, but look, it, it forms part of your analysis as well, right? Um, to consider. Let's, before we get into, uh, 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 we talked about this a, a little bit before we actually opened the webinar, but um, I want to just talk about this one uh, notion before we go a little more deeply into some of the visa categories. You mentioned the topic of what is work. What can you do in the United States as a, as a visitor? And you mentioned that this was a hot topic. Do you want to mm -hmm. um, just bring talk about that for a moment? Yeah, I I like if I had a dollar for every time I got asked this question, like it happens every every day. People are saying, oh, I want to come to visit. You know, what can I do? Uh, you know, and it doesn't necessarily just come up with visitors. It also comes up with like students. Um, how, when do I need to be work authorized, right? Um, how, how do I know if I'm working? At what point do I cross that threshold? Same with like H1Bs with, you know, current employee with your, with your current employer. At what point do you cross the line? Um, and I think, you know, it, it's hard because there's no clear definition of work in immigration law. Um, and so to kind of think about what we might think of as, um, as, De defining work we are actually looking at employment and tax law to see how are we defining work and we're really thinking of work um as performing services in exchange for compensation or value so it's that idea right you're doing something in exchange for compensation or value um and so you can think of things like um you know people always say oh i'm not getting paid you know, well, that doesn't make you safe, so to speak, right? Um, because you could be, your value could be equity in a startup, in a future equity in a startup that's growing, right? And I think you kind of think of like, if, you know, for, for those who are in the US in terms of to figuring out when they might need to be, you know, getting work authorization, um, you know, would you be paying somebody to do what you're doing, you know? And, and would somebody be expected to be paid versus like, you're not going in and volunteering at a food pantry where there's no expectation of that. Um, you know, you can do some preliminary things like you can incorporate the startup and um, you can sign a lease, you know, you can meet with potential investors, you can negotiate contracts, you can go to conferences and you could maybe, you know, do some type of like preliminary like discovery type work um, or like activities. And I think that those things are kind of like early and, and more passive and not exactly work related. Um, but when you get into, you know, hiring employees, managing operations, engaging in day to day activities, you know, those types of things, you know, that is looking a lot like work um, for for, you know, international startup founders coming in. There's no threshold of like if you're here for X amount of days, you know, you're safe. And I think there is, you know, a school of thought that says if you're physically in the US performing services here, then you need to have a visa. Um, so I think that that is very, it's a very gray area. Um, and you just want to give your clients the advice to say the subjectivity of like that decision to, um, you know, admit you or not is based on CBP at the, at the airport or port of entry. So let's, let's run through a couple of hypotheticals. So let's say someone who's contemplating establishing a business in the United States comes here as a tourist. Uh, so can they do the, what would you say about doing the following things? Uh, meeting with other people to discuss their startup idea. Is that okay? I would say meetings, right? It's an, 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 a startup idea. It sounds like it's, you know, preliminary. Um, now, again, just know I'm not the adjudicator of entry into the US. And, and this is where it's like, it's a bit gray, you know? So there's no, I, I think that there's not a lot of definite guidance on these. So it's just kind of based on like our experience and what we would sometimes being conservative versus, you know, taking a bit more of a risk. 
How about talking to potential investors about your startup idea? I think that's permitted. Mm -hmm. How about uh, establishing or, or registering a corporation uh, which you intend to use for your company at some yeah, point? Yeah, I think you can also do that as well. You can incorporate okay. the company, I think, yeah. Okay. How about interviewing people that you hypothetically would want to work with you down the line just a bit? I mean, then you're, are you getting into Perfect. more of a hiring situation? Um, and, you know, another thing to keep in mind is that U.S. immigration law only applies to you while you're physically in the U.S., mm -hmm. you know? So if you needed to interview somebody, could you maybe do the preliminary interview through Zoom? And then right. you're doing the bulk of the interviewing and then you're just meeting them for a coffee. And then, you know, the kind of thinking about it in that way as well. Um, you just, I think, like hiring and again if you're like interviewing all day long and all that that's like a job that's like a, someone in HR would be doing that as a job so I just think you might need to be careful as well about the, about like I think a once-off conversation with somebody but if you were here and had weeks or days of like interview schedules I think that that might might be a little problematic yeah I think I think our audience gets the point I think you have to yeah. just exer you have to exercise caution uh, you know, it's th things that are theoretical, hypothetical, or purely formalistic, like registering a corporation, probably fine. When you start actually performing the functions that you would be doing if the business were live, that's when you're starting to get into the gray area. Yeah. Um, let's let's go back to that idea about the H-1B. So if you're on an H-1B and you have a startup idea, again, at what point are you, At what, how, how close to the line can you go? And also, if you establish a company and you and you do raise some, uh, you raise funds from investors, uh, can you hire yourself uh, under an H-1B? Can you do that immediately once you have some, you know, money in the bank to operate some operating capital, or at what point uh, are you able to to hire uh, people in H one B status, and can you hire yourself if you're one of the principal co founders? Yeah, I love this. This is like right up my alley. This exact okay. kind of scenario. Okay. Um, glad I, yeah, glad I came. Yeah, up yeah. So because it's it's very it's a very common fact pattern. So I think like in general when an immigrant is wanting to create an entity or a startup, um, sometimes it's a great idea if they have a business partner who's not subject to the immigration laws in the way that they are. And I recommend this from, from international students. Like if you have a classmate who isn't, doesn't need to get OPT approved to work for a startup, like, um, you know, it could be a great idea to have a business partner who doesn't need to get immigration, you know, USCIS to approve anything for them to work out, right? So um, in this scenario, like you, this, this does happen quite a lot. Um, and I think it's, it's, so to answer the question, can a founder have a H1B for their own startup? They can, um, with a few caveats, right? There's some more hurdles that they're going to have to jump over than, you know, I'm a software developer at, um, Docketwise, you know, I don't have an ownership in, in, in Docketwise, you know, I'm, I'm not maybe gonna be faced with these additional hurdles that I would if I was my own, if I was a founder in my own startup. And really the three main things that they need to think about is this idea of like an employer employee relationship. Um, so the H1B does require that employer employee relationship. Now, you can have a founder that has some ownership in the startup, but I wouldn't recommend over 50% of ownership in a startup, right? You want to establish some independence from the company and you, and ideally have an independent board of directors that is um, able to dictate the terms and conditions of your employment. Um, and so you are, yes, you are an owner, but you're also an employee and you're subject to um, the terms and conditions of employment uh, like any other employee. Um, so that's one thing. Um, you do need to disclose the ownership interest as well. So keep that in mind. Then you need to make sure that you're doing a specialty occupation job. Everybody wants to be CEO. You know, that's the title that everyone wants to be. But I don't think that's a great title for a specialty occupation because it's not very niche. You don't need a specific degree, you know, a degree in a specific field. So, you know, working with them on, on what's the what's the what's the actual role here? Because I don't think CEO is great, although I have been able to bring founders from, you know, OPT to H1B and then maybe to O1 and then to EB1A because O1, you know, you can be CEO, no problem. That's actually great for the O1, not for the H1B. And then finally, making sure that you're, that there's, you know, a, that the startup can pay you the prevailing wage. Um, and so again, like 
these are, I think, some hurdles that other, you know, working for bigger employers and where you, where you don't have this ownership interest in the company, you're just not going to have to face those things. So um, with all that being said, I wouldn't recommend that, like, you're the first and only employee of your H1B, of the company that's going to be sponsoring your H1B. It would be an idea to have some other employees in there because, you know, not only do you need to be doing specialty occupation work, you need to be doing that for the duration of the petitions for how long you're requesting in the in the petition. So, you know, you don't want to have like, oh, it's a brand new startup. We don't really know. You know, you'd want to be able to document if if requested that, that the individual is going to be performing specialty occupation work throughout the petition. And so, um, you know, right at the start when nothing else has happened, it might be a bit too early. Right. And so you'd need to be strategic about, um, you know, timing and, and who else is working for the for the petitioner and those types of things. Now, how much is the fi- how much does the financial piece come into play? I mean, with the I-140, for example, you're specifically required to prove ability to pay the prevailing wage. Yeah. Uh, does that come up in the I-129 context? To um, get um, our feed on prevailing wage? On- I don't know. No. I mean, the employer is attesting to the fact that they will pay the prevailing mm-hmm. wage. I have not seen, you know, I've been doing this a long time and, um, you know, we don't document proactively ability to pay in the way that you, you're you actually required to for the I-140. But you do, there is an obligation on the startup to pay that prevailing wage or the actual wage, whichever is higher. So, um. I think it's a little different insofar as the I-140, like you're specifically required to document that um, in, with the filing of the case from when the priority date is established in, in the firm context. Got it. Okay. Now, do you see many startup uh, founders utilizing the the O-1 and the EB-1 uh, extraordinary ability category? Is that a, is that a fairly regular occurrence? Yes, it is. And it's, it, you know, yeah. I think the ecosystem can really support the O1. I love O and A's for startup founders. Um, you know, when you think or O and B, like I said, more often it's O and A in business. Um, but when you think about, you know, the criteria for O1s and you think about the startup um kind of ecosystem, I think that like it naturally can can pair well. For example, like everybody loves to read about startups. There's a lot of press, there's a lot of startup publications, there's tons of awards, right? There's all these like x under whatever age or you know 10 innovators to watch and this and that there's all these awards there's potential for that um there's a lot of originality so original contributions of major significance is one so you know whether you have a patent or not or you've developed a new system and you have it's been implemented by customers and you have all that you know um also potential awards of venture capital um being admitted into certain prestigious incubators or accelerators um you know those types of things i think that the ecosystem is very rich with evidence that can lend itself very nicely to a strong o1 and um again like it's obviously case by case specific and i don't think if somebody has it's like I was chatting to somebody a while ago and it's their first startup and it's brand new and they they, they really don't have, it's it's so early um, that while, you know, I think maybe they can work up to the O one I just don't know that it's ready right now. So in that scenario, um, this is where you could see the startup parole program, the International Entrepreneur Parole Program being a, a great kind of stop gap in there where they don't quite have the attraction that they may you know, need for the O1A, but they do have funding and, uh, you know, they, they are able to potentially, you know, show the potential of the startup, therefore enabling them to, to apply for the startup role. Right. I mean, that's really, that really sharpens the point that we made earlier where it's, not, you know, there are options, but the options, a lot of the other options have a different color, a different flavor, and they're not specifically ha- have the flavor that you're establishing a startup, you're going to seek funding for the startup. And and it's the, the, the idea that it's a new and potentially, you know, high growth or growing enterprise, you know, that would be, and its potential to grow, that would be the basis for entering the United States, for getting the parole or getting a, you know, a visa if there yeah. were a startup visa. So that's really, you know, what comes out as the difference um, and what's lacking the existing categories. How about the national interest waiver? Do you, do you, do you see that utilized? Um, I mean, I can see that coming up if you're doing, let's say, environment, something in environmental technology, maybe something relating to transportation or infrastructure. Have you had any cases utilizing the NIW? I mean, I tend to use 
um, EB1As over the national interest waiver. And okay. the reason for that has been because of the processing times for national interest waivers. Um, but I'm not sure if you heard, but just last week, the USAIS announced that premium processing is going to be available for national interest waivers on a, you know, as, as we're filing them. Um, so to me, this is a total game changer for, for this option for people. Again, assuming you're not from a country, unfortunately, like India or China with a backlog for EB2s. Um, so, but, you know, it, it's hard to file a case and say to the client, you're waiting 12 to 24 months to hear anything back just on the I-140 part of the case. Um, but I do think that, I mean, I'm obviously very familiar with the national interest waiver option. I think that it can work really well for people if you're able to show, you know, the scope of the work being beyond, you know, your region and, you know, the employment um, aspect of your startup can also help to, um, you know, solidify the national interest kind of argument there. Um, but I, I feel like we're going to be seeing a lot more of these cases because of the premium processing being available for them kind of concurrently with filing. All right, good to know. Glad to hear about that premium process. And that's a change, and it's an important change. I mean, I think what scares a lot of people uh, about the national interest waiver is the sort of, I guess I could call it idiosyncratic sort of adjudication standards where it's really sort of, uh, you know, uh, they have a certain slant on what constitutes the, the, the national interest. And it's, 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 it's not apparent, uh, you know, you know uh, uh, what criteria they're really using to determine what they consider yeah. to be the national interest. So that's yeah. really, how about the T? Just one other the... thing, James, if you don't uh -huh, mind. Sure. Um, I just yeah. wanted to note that the Biden administration made a series of statements in relation to STEM workers in January of last year, so about a year ago. And with that, they actually updated the ONA policy manual and the national interest waiver manual to essentially modernize the evidence that we can use in support of these cases. So um, they also specifically refer to critical interests, critical um, technologies being kind of inherently in the national interest. And um, they gave examples of specifically for like PhDs, right, where before we were like, oh, we're not really sure how like a PhD or and it also in the O&A, like, oh, if it was a student kind of award you received as a student, like, is that going to be good enough? Or if you don't have like a huge salary, can you use your equity for compensation, which we had all long been arguing that you could, the policy manuals have been updated. So please look at them. You can see the appendix, um, appendix in there and you can see examples of like the criteria fleshed out and kind of modernized. And that's another thing that the White House said they wanted to do. Utilize the existing law without having to go through Congress to kind of flesh this out and make it more modern, more accessible. And in their words, kind of more create more certainty for these STEM and PhD and startup entrepreneurs. This is what they want to do. And this is kind of how they're choosing to do that. Um, it doesn't mean that every officer is going to be fully in, on board with that. You still really need to, you know, overly document your case from the get go. Understood. Uh, can you be a startup founder on a TN visa? Um, I think that's tricky. I believe there's an ownership threshold over which you can't have. So, I mean, maybe again, if you had other co-founders that were able to kind of shoulder the majority of the ownership and again, looking at your role, making sure it's on the TN list. Um, it's not an option that we've utilized a ton. It's not to say you can't do it, but um, you just be mindful of the ownership interest. Okay. Can you be a, a startup employee of, or as an F1 student on OPT? Would there be any barrier? Yeah, we see a lot of people on OPT. Um, okay. I think when you're on OPT, when you're, which you're here as an F1, right? Even though you're working on OPT, your status as F1 student, you're kind of friendly port of call is the international students office they should be able to give you some guidance in relation to when you need to apply for OBT it's so important that you get all these deadlines correct and um, you know you you have a lot of flexibility more flexibility on the initial 12 months of OBT than you do on the 12 24 month stem extension for that there are some additional things that you need some additional hoops that you need to jump through because there's a training plan involved there's the um you know there's an attestation on the training plan that an employer needs to sign off on you need to be e-verified so there's other things there and so again kind of going back to when it's a good idea to have like a founder who doesn't have those limitations so um yeah but i have a lot of times that is the trajectory of of the startup founder is you know opt and, and then other options afterwards okay um, that's uh 
very informative. Um, well, you know, Fiona, it's been awesome having you here to discuss some of these visa categories, and we spent a lot of time on the entrepreneur role. If, you know, when and if there's movement on the entrepreneur role, we're certainly going to have you back uh, as a follow-up um, and just follow this issue. Great. Thanks, James. And one final thing, I just... Yes. We're just about to, I'm just about to release an ebook. It's US immigration options for startups, accelerate your American dream. It's going to be, we're going to provide a coupon to complimentary download for people if they want. And so some of these concepts are discussed in depth in kind of a question and answer format and hopefully makes it accessible for people um, to, to kind of digest some of these, you know, more complicated um, concepts and kind of just put everything in the one spot. So we hope that that will be helpful for people too. I presume that'll be available from your website. Yeah, I think we're still we're almost in the final edits of it now. And I think we're going to have it as an ebook on Amazon. We're still figuring out the logistics of like the distribution, but it should be available in the next week or two anyway. Oh, OK, soon. All right. There you have it. Get the book. Get the book. Mm -hmm, yeah. All right. Thanks again, Fiona. Thanks, thanks to all of you.